I don't think you'll need it, but if you like it, no. Huh? Well, that's what Oh, like they're Well, for the next one, so let's leave it there and then we can move it afterwards, okay? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our annual Candidates and Issues Forum. My name is Ulrich Salzgaber. I'm the CEO of the Steamboat Springs Board of Realtors. And once again, we're very honored to be able to co-host this event with the Steamboat Pilot and today, the Steamboat Springs Chamber of Commerce, the Rau County Democrats and the Rau County Republicans. It's a, a great group of people when we put this together and we hope that uh, it brings you some very informative um, uh, stances uh, this evening. So uh, before we get to this uh, evening is going to be moderated by Eli Pace, the editor of the Steamboat Springs Pilot today. But before we do that, we have the honor of having the singing schools uh, conduct the national anthem. Was it singing jewels? The jewel singers, I'm sorry. Thank you guys, wonderful. So we had 110 seats set up, uh, thinking that was would be enough, obviously it isn't. So very honored to have this many people attend and to respect your time, without further ado, I will introduce Eli Pace. Hello, my name is Eli Pace. I'm the editor of the Steamboat Pilot in today, and I will be moderating tonight's election forum with help from Steamboat Pilot and Today reporter Dylan Anderson. Both parties have agreed to the forum format 
but we'll go over the rules real quickly for audience members. Candidates in contested races will each be given two minutes for an opening statement. The candidate who speaks first was determined by a coin flip prior to the forum. Each candidate will then have one minute to answer each of four questions, which will be the same for both candidates. The candidates will alternate in the order they answer the questions, so each has an equal number of opportunities to speak first. Finally, each candidate will be given one minute for a closing statement. Candidates did not receive the questions in advance, and there will be no questions from the audience. The format will be the same for local ballot issues. Those speaking in favor or against an issue will have the opportunity to make a two-minute present or two-minute opening statement. They will have one minute to answer four questions each and make one make a one-minute closing statement. The uncontested races and uncontested ballot issues will each offer a two-minute presentation along with some questions. I request that forum participants honor the established time limits. Timekeepers will be timing each response and using the cards to alert you when your time is um, nearing the end. I will stop candidates once their time has passed. For the candidates, it's good to remember that voters are interested in your vision and goals. With that in mind, I ask that candidates refrain from negative comments about their opponents and instead focus on their own attributes, experience, and policy positions. Thank you for your participation. We will get started tonight by inviting the candidate for assessor. Here or the table? Uh, go ahead. Okay. All right. Let me get my stopwatch going. So I got two minutes. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this event. My name is Gary Peterson. I am the county assessor. I'm on the ballot, uncontested for my fourth term. I've been the assessor for uh, since 2010. I was appointed by the commissioners. Uh, I do valuation, as you as you all know, probably. Um, so in my quick time here, I will just tell you that 2023 is a reappraisal year, and that's going to be a big reassessment. Uh, we reassess all property every other year. My data collection or my sales start July of 20, going through June of 22 this summer. That's pretty much hitting kind of the top of the market as we're seeing. Do not shoot the messenger. I only report what those realtors are out there doing, pushing very expensive properties, okay? I just report what they're selling, okay? All right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna be scary. You all get a love letter from me come May of 23 that tells you what your new value is. That's gonna be as of June, of the summer, not when you get it in May. It takes us nine months to do the mass mass appraisal. You get a chance to protest that. That's the month of May. The legislators gave you an extra week to procrastinate and then turn in your protest on that last day. So instead of four weeks, you get five weeks. So I'll be around to answer questions, put some business cards out somewhere. And my door is always open. My phone is I don't answer it too often, I'm busy, but I'll get back to you. Um, so uh, please, if you got questions, concerns, call me, I'm gonna listen to you and we'll, we'll figure it out. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up to the stage, I would like to invite your candidate for county treasurer. tough act to follow. Um, uh, thank you for taking your time to be here tonight. I'm gonna be quick and brief, but I do encourage you to come up as Gary said, um, let me know what we can do better. Let me know what you like. I'm always available to talk. I'm your route county treasurer, Lane Yacovetto. 
When I campaigned in 2018, I told the taxpayers of Route County that I would integrate su successful business practices and principles into our local government. I committed to create accountability, increase efficiency, transparency, accuracy, and in collaboration with all county departments. I'm happy to report to you tonight that I have accomplished these goals. The Route County Treasurer's Office has become a model office used as an example of best practices and procedures and policy, not only to other local, uh, not only to other counties in Colorado, but also to associations like CCI and the State Treasurer's Office. We have accomplished so many and so many big tasks in the last four years. Um, we have not only safely invested our public funds, we ensure that schools, fires, and library districts get their tax distribution in an accurate and timely manner. Um, I've served on the Colorado Treasurers Association Legislation Committee. I'm co-chair of the Continuing Education Committee. Um, I'm responsible for keeping and updating the county treasurer's manual. And within the county, I've been the leader of the economic development team, co-chair of the Good Governance Committee. I'm on the policy review committee. I've created a cash handling policy. I've redone um, our investment policy. I've cross-train and cross-verify. We spot audit, audit our departments. Um, my team and I are looking forward to continue to provide, providing superior customer service every year and under budget. I thank you for the support and the opportunity to serve you in the county treasurer's office. Thank you. Up next, I'd like to invite the candidate for county clerk and recorder. Good evening. My name is Jenny Thomas, and I was appointed earlier this year as the Route County Clerk and Recorder. I replaced Kim Bonner when she retired, and I will be on the ballot this year as an unaffiliated candidate. I just wanted to take a few minutes to give you some updates regarding elections, motor vehicle, and recording. This November, you will see 11 statewide questions on your ballot. And we also have one countywide referendum, and that's 1A. Most of South Route will see a question from the Library District 6A, and City of Steamboat will vote on Referred Measure 2A. In addition to these questions, you will see judges retention, federal and state offices, and of course our local offices. You're going to have a one page two sided ballot. Ballots will start mailing next Monday, October 17th. Election day is November 8th. There will be three polling centers set up on election day. These are located at Oak Creek Town Hall, Hayden Town Hall, and the downtown courthouse in the annex. You can also drop a ballot off at the Oak Creek Town Hall, Yampa Town Hall, Hayden Town Hall, Clark Store Clerk's Office, mail it back or drop it in one of our two 24 seven drop boxes. And those are located at the old sheriff's parking lot and in the alley behind the annex. The last day to request a ballot in the mail is Monday, October 31st. After this date, it's too late for us to mail a ballot and we don't recommend mailing one back to our office after that date. You'll need to come in person to request a replacement ballot as postmarks do not count. Your ballot must be received no later than 7 p.m. on election day. On election night, our office will do no less than three results uploads. These will occur just after 7 p.m. when polls close, right around 9, and then once again before we go home. I also wanted to take a moment to thank all of our election judges who are members of our community who take their time and use it working with us in the election. We're very grateful for all of your help, and without you guys, we really couldn't do it. It takes a lot of effort, planning, and people from both sides of the aisle. And for you guys, we are extremely grateful. I also just wanted to take a quick second to tell you about an update in motor vehicle that's going to happen in 2023, and that's going to be your state parks pass, and that's going to happen on every registration and renewal. It's an opt-out program, so just make sure if you don't want it on all your cars that you're opting out for that. Other than that, look for your ballot starting next week. All right, up next we have an issue and I would like to invite Deb Curtis to speak about the uh, South Route Library ballot question. Yes. But if you'd like to open or offer opening remarks.
Ballot 6A would remove the revenue cap for the South Route Library District that has two branch libraries in Yampa and Oak Creek. The mill levy from property taxes for 2012 was $142,000. In 2022, the mill levy from property taxes is $100,500. This is due to the 2008 recession, the decrease in production for the 20 mile coal mine and the inability to, for our budget to grow beyond 5.5% per year due to Tabor restrictions. The mill levy from property taxes for the Hayden Library is $227,000 for one library and 1,800 residents compared with our 100,500 for two libraries and 3,200 residents. The reason for the dif dif difference is Hayden Library got out of Tabor several years ago. The library district in South Route was given legal advice several years ago from an attorney saying it was illegal. But the towns of Oak Creek and Yampa, the Yampa and Oak Creek Fire Departments, the South Route Medical Center, and the Hayden and Bud Werner Libraries are no longer under Tabor, which requires a vote of the residents. Ballot 6A would increase resident property taxes by less than $2 per month for a $400,000 residence. Commercial but would be less than $4 per month on the same valued property. These figures were obtained from Gary Peterson, Route County Assessor's Office. The cost of books in the last 10 years have increased 50% and employee salaries have not kept up with inflation. This is also the case with utilities, maintenance, office supplies, and other expenses. Unfortunately, if ballot 6A does not pass, there is a very real possibility that one of the libraries will have to close. Uh, first question. What services does the library offer the community and why do you think they are important? We offer free internet, free wireless. We have access to books throughout the state of Colorado if they are not on our shelves. Um, we, can, we provide all kinds of reference information for you. Um, everything a library does. And we have a big di digital collection too. It, with the Aspen Cat Library System. Okay. How are changing assessed uh, valuations due to changes in the coal-fired power generation industry, specifically the mine, impacting the tax or the tax district's revenue? It is caused our mill levy to fall, and it's a it's a combination of things. I've talked to Gary Peterson about this, but. Due to the coal mine cutting down on production, it has probably been between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars that the South Route Library District has lost over the past ten years. Now you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but this will give you a chance to kind of emphasize your uh, response. How will opting out of Tabor or debrucing benefit local businesses in the community and the South Route Library District? Well, per Gary Peterson, he said in 2024, we will get $68,000, which will help us immensely to buy more books, have more programming, and um, to pay our employees the salaries that they deserve. What do you think is the most important part of this ballot measure for voters to understand as they go to the ballots this November? There is a very real possibility that one of the libraries will close and it will probably be in Yampa because they have less door traffic and less circulation of items that go out of the library. And would you like to offer a uh, one minute closing remark? Yes. yes. Ballot 6A will secure the long-term sustainability of the South Route Library District, bring staff salaries to reasonable levels, improve technology and programming, and help with library improvements. Also on ballot 6A, there is a significant increase for the 2021 budget, which is due to the purchase of a library for Oak Creek at a cost of $345,000, $172,500 of which was a Dola grant. The library district did not have a library director for eight years in order to save funds to purchase a library for Oak Creek. Instead of paying 15,000 a year to lease and 
we also have a larger facility now as well. And we're on Main Street, which has a better visibility, accessibility, and presence in the in the community. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Next up, we will be looking at the Route County Sheriff's race. I would like to welcome uh, candidate Doug Shear to the uh, stage, and then we'll also have uh, Pete Wood making a remark for Garrett Wiggins, who is also a candidate in this race as well. Hey, good evening. Thanks for uh, having us all here. Sorry, the sheriff couldn't be here, but he had prepared some remarks he wanted me to read for him. So I'm proud to do that for him. So, uh, oh, I want to apologize for not being here tonight, but I had already made travel plans that were difficult to change. Although someone else is reading this on my behalf, I write this as if I were here speaking directly to you. First, I am on honored and thankful for all the support I have received over the past 12 years while serving as your sheriff. I have proudly spent nearly my entire life serving route, uh, my adult life uh, serving Route County and other communities as a law enforcement professional. For more than 32 years, I have been honored to work with various law enforcement agencies in different capacities, but I can say without hesitation, serving as your sheriff has been the pinnacle of my career. For those of us in the profession, we understand law enforcement can be very difficult, dangerous, and a challenging profession. The long hours, high stress situations, sudden adrenaline, adrenaline spikes and dumps, along with common occurrences of dealing with people when they are having the worst day in their life, takes a huge toll on a peace officer's mental and physical wellness. It is not a career for everyone, but for those of you who choose to serve, I personally want to thank you. I speak of the difficulties of a career in law enforcement because I believe it is important that our citizens understand that even though peace officers hold very a very unique job with a lot of authority that our success totally hinges on citizens and their teamwork and involvement. It is a fact that peace officers cannot work alone and expect a high degree of success. <clears throat> we depend on every one of you to be the eyes and ears in our community as we cannot possibly be everywhere at the same time. We want each of you to be a part of our public safety team and feel comfortable communicating with us so we together achieve our goal of keeping Route County the safe and wonderful place we call home. Over the past 12 years, the Sheriff's Office has achieved many goals and objectives while working to hard to comply and keep up with the pace, fast pace of change. Inappropriate police actions in our county, in our country have demanded rapid change and the Sheriff's Office has done well to adapt and comply with those demands. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody, appreciate it. Now, Doug, if you would like to offer your opening remarks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Shear. I'm running for Route County Sheriff. I grew up in Route County, and I graduated from Steamboat Springs High School in 1993. I began my public safety uh, career in 1995 with Route County Communications. And I also served as a reserve deputy at the Route County Sheriff's Office. After a year in dispatch, I moved to uh, the Route County Jail as a detention deputy, and then shortly afterwards, I uh, was promoted to patrol deputy of the Route County Sheriff's Office. During my time on patrol as a field, tra field training officer, a firearms instructor, and I served years as an investigator. I was promoted to patrol uh, sergeant in 2004, and I served in that position for about a year before leaving to work for the Steamboat Springs Police Department. I worked for the Steamboat Springs Police Department for about six and a half years, and then I returned to the Sheriff's Office as a patrol sergeant. I served in that position as patrol sergeant for the Sheriff's Office for about two and a half years before I was uh, promoted to patrol lieutenant. And then shortly after that, I was uh, promoted to undersheriff, where I've served for the last five years. My responsibilities of undersheriff are uh, I'm in charge of daily operations for patrol administration in the Rock County Jail. My entire 27 year law enforcement career has been here in Route County, the place I've called home for my uh, entire life. It's been an honor and it's a privilege to serve the community I grew up in. 
Thank you. All right. Um, no question about who we're going to first. <laughs> first question. How do you see that crime impacts Route County businesses and what opportunities are there to partner with these businesses to help decrease the cost of crime? Uh, in Route County, um, you know, we're kind of spread out. So we have a lot of different geographical areas that we have to address from North Route, uh, West Route, the town of Yampa. So we're really spread out. It's important, and one of my priorities is to establish and maintain partnerships with uh, all of our communities in Route County. And when you develop those partnerships and you stop in and you visit those businesses, uh, you, you create these relationships with people where they're more willing to speak to you about what's going on in the community and report those crimes, and then also partner and work with them to uh, come up with deterrence uh, to try and uh, prevent those crimes from happening. Thank you. Um, next question. According to a recent bipartisan report from the Common Sense Institute, the number of crimes across Colorado year to date have increased in seven major categories, including robbery, arson, motor, vehicle theft, buying stolen property, vandalism, prostitution or pandering, and drug possession and sales. Is this the same for us here in Route County? And what will you do as sheriff to impact these rates? It's not the same for us here in Route County. Route County is very fortunate that we don't see a, a vast majority of those crimes that you just mentioned. But one of the biggest things that we do uh, see up here is uh, drug distribution and drug use. And uh, the biggest thing is uh, probably the uh, fentanyl pandemic. Um, the biggest thing that we can do, you know, law enforcement can do so much as far as making traffic stops and doing investigations to deter drug use. But the biggest thing we can do is, again, maintain those partnerships with our community and organizations and uh, uh, education, education on what fentanyl is doing to our community. It's not just our youth. It's, it's the entire age gamut. And I think the education is important uh, to get out there and just talk about how dangerous fentanyl is. Thank you. Next question. Local business owners and their employees are stretched thin due to staffing issues, the pandemic, and other problems. How do you plan to face mental health issues both internally within the sheriff's office and externally in our community? It's a great question. And it's uh, something I'm very passionate about. Um, our mental health resources for everyone in Route County are lacking. And one project that I've been working on uh, to try and establish is a co-responder with the uh, Sheriff's Office. Uh, Steamboat Springs has a partnership with Mind Springs right now, but that's just for the city of Steamboat Springs. We need a good, robust co-responder program for all of Route County, not just the city of Steamboat Springs. Um, so the research I've been doing is uh, getting with community partners, um, the hospital, anybody who has a stake in mental health uh, treatment awareness and response in Route County to try and come up with one robust program that will work for everybody so that all these different organizations aren't competing and trying to come up with solutions. We can all work together and have a good robust system for all Route County. Thank you. Now, last question. Active shooter incidents have become more common across the nation. What are the sheriff's responsibilities prior to, during, and after a mass shooting incident? How can you work with local schools, businesses, nonprofits, and others to be better prepared in the event something like this happens in our community? That's another great question. And what we've been doing in the past is getting with uh, uh, businesses, the schools, and uh, active, uh, actively teaching uh, standard response protocol, whether it be in the schools or a business, the uh, protocols are similar, but basically what to watch for and how to respond if something were to happen, regardless of being a school, you have your place of work or you're just the grocery store shopping. So we've had a lot of requests and we go out and we actually teach these, uh, these, these skills and um, these, how to be aware of these things that are going on. Another thing we're passionate about is uh, working with the schools. Um, last year, we put in for a school resource officer. We were a little short staffed on patrol, so we didn't get the funding because we still had other positions to fill. 
we still put an officer in the schools that the county is responsible for. This year, we asked for another school resource officer, um, and we're right in the middle of budget season, so we'll see how it goes. But we feel it's very important to partner with the schools and have officers as liaisons in the schools. Thank you, Doug. Um, would you like to offer closing remarks? <clears throat> I, I kind of feel, you know, a little unfair advantage up here being by myself, but, um, you know, I guess the biggest thing I'll say is, again, uh, I've been here my entire life. My entire law enforcement career has been uh, in local law enforcement. I started with the sheriff's, sheriff's office and went to the city of Steamboat Springs, but I came back to the sheriff's office because my passion is all of Route County and not just one community in Route County. I love where I live. I love my career and I love serving the, the citizens of Route County. And um, it's been an honor for 27 years and I'd like to continue that service. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I would like to invite our two candidates for Colorado Senate District 8, Matt Solomon and Dylan Roberts. Prior to this debate, uh, we flipped coins to see who would go first. Uh, candidate Roberts, would you like to offer your opening remarks? All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Steamboat Pilot, the Realtors, the Chamber, and uh, both parties for putting this on and for this opportunity. It's great to be here with, with uh, Mr. Solomon uh, to talk with you all tonight. Uh, it's a great to be back in Steamboat, the place where I grew up and was raised and have had the privilege of representing for the last four years in the Colorado State House. And during my time in the State House, we have accomplished a great deal for Route County and for Colorado. Uh, we have focused on turning the challenges and problems that we had here in our community and finding results for all of you. And we've lowered health insurance costs, for example, by over 35% here in Route County and across the Western Slope. And I wrote and passed the bill that made Colorado the first state in the country to cap the cost of insulin for people with diabetes. And we lowered prescription drug costs across the board for seniors and for Coloradans. Just this past year, I worked with many local leaders here in the Steamboat and Route County community to pass the largest investment the state has ever made into affordable housing, which is gonna result in millions of dollars coming to Route County to help build more housing for our workforce. And I've worked tirelessly with our local agriculture community and our uh, conservation partners to preserve our Colorado water, uh, to cut taxes and red tape for businesses, and to pass programs like the Rural Jumpstart Program to diversify and incentivize our rural economy. And every single bill that I just mentioned has been bipartisan because I believe much more in working with anybody. If it's good for Route County, it's good for our district, I wanna get it done and find results for you. And we have a lot more work to do and that's why I'm running to be your next state Senator. We need to do more to address the affordability in our mountain and rural communities by investing more in long-term solutions for affordable housing to bring down healthcare costs and make childcare more affordable. We can do more to protect our communities from wildfire and drought and make sure our rural economies can continue to grow. And finally, the state legislature is a place where your personal freedoms are now decided. And I will always protect your personal freedoms as your state senator. So I look forward to this uh, discussion tonight. Thank you all for being here. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you. Candidate Solomon, if you would like to offer your opening remarks. Thank you, sir. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to the paper and to the chamber and to the Realtors Association for hosting this event. Without all of you in this room, this would not be possible. My name is Matt Solomon and I'm excited to be your next state Senator. I am passionate about this district and I care deeply about this state that I've lived in for the last 26 years. For the last 21 years, I've worked in public service as a paramedic, a deputy coroner. I still work with our US military and I was twice elected to Eagles Town Council. At the same time, I've launched two companies internationally, two of my own in Eagle, and I've consulted for numerous other companies. This balance of public and private sector experience offers me the perspective to see that legislation is more than just a nice title and good intention. There's a ripple effect, and that, that perspective is necessary so that we can think through the bills and the laws that come down the pipeline. Our government should not grant us freedom through the legislature. 
Our government has grown 25% in the last four years. That's $8 billion added to our budget. Our health insurance costs are projected to go up anywhere from 5 to 33% next year, according to the Department of Insurance. It is more expensive for us to live here today than it has been ever before. He was speaking with the sheriffs about the fentanyl crisis we're facing. It is worse than ever before, and I hope we discuss that tonight as well. My ability to bridge gaps and to work together eliminates words like bipartisan from my vocabulary because I don't want to enable the divide that's happening in our state. I want us to come together to bridge that gap and work for a better Colorado tomorrow. The rural urban divide does not need to exist. And I want to be the first plank in that bridge. I hope to earn your trust. I hope to earn your support. I remain available to you and I look forward to earning your vote. Thank you. Candidate Solomon, we'll have you answer the first question first. With looming changes in the coal-fired power generation industry in the Yampa Valley, what is your plan to support local governments and tax districts facing dramatic losses in revenue, and how do you plan to fund it? We have a date without a plan. We have money coming down the pipeline called transition funding to help people transition into a big question mark. We need to come up with environmentally sustainable solutions that are also economically sustainable. We need to support our population here. And I'm already working with Senator Rankin on some energy plans and environmentally safe solutions that will help this valley and the valley next door and all of our workers that are here today that have not left. And hopefully we can bring more in. But we need to think long term, not today. And the bills of the last four years have been detrimental to this county and the county next door. And we need to correct that course. Thank you. Candidate Roberts, uh, same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? No, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, because many communities in Senate District 8 are going through this transition. And I've been working uh, for the last four years to help our communities through this transition. Uh, I currently represent the town of Hayden, a responsibility I take very seriously and have worked with them on several pieces of specific legislation. So they do have a plan when that transition happens. For example, House Bill 21-1324, a bill that I worked on with Republican Rod Pelton last year, is going to give Hayden the ability to transition their coal-fired power plant to renewable energy and keep every single job in the community of Hayden and possibly possibly grow more and because of legislation that I worked on. This past year, the Just Transition Fund was only going to get $5 million. I worked to make sure that got plus up to $15 million. And these are real funds that are being used by our communities. Hayden and Craig just received significant grants for Just Transition work to build a business park in Hayden and to help Craig with community uh, and economic diversification. We can also use this as an opportunity to grow the economies in the Yampa Valley and across the state by diversifying our rural economy and creating business incentives to bring new uh, jobs into these communities. Thank you, candidate Roberts. Now, candidate Roberts, the next question will go to you first. Colorado's current assessment percentage for residential property tax is 7.15%. And for all commercial and business personal property, the assessment percentage is 29%. Do you support these percentages? And if not, what should they be? So, uh, those percentages are the result of what used to be in our constitution, the Gallagher Amendment. And that was uh, an amendment that set the rate between residential and commercial rates. And so that's the reason why they are that way. Uh, the Colorado voters in 2020 voted pretty overwhelmingly to uh, repeal the Gallagher Amendment, which locked those percentages in place. If we had not repealed the Gallagher Amendment, the commercial rate would have continued to rise and the residential rate would have continued to lower, with putting an uh, unfair burden, in my opinion, on businesses and commercial properties. Uh, now that Gallagher has been repealed, those rates are locked in place for four years. We're in year two of the four-year process. Uh, the legislature is going to be responsible over the next two years to come up with a new formula or new rates. And we need advocates from our rural communities, I believe, to go down to the Capitol and make sure that our specific needs that uh, in our property uses in rural Colorado are different than the metro areas and tell that story and make sure we uh, have a formula that works for all communities. That could be a regional-based solution. It could be a statewide solution. Uh, but this is a conversation the legislature is going to be having in the next few years, and I look forward to being a part of it. Thank you, Candidate Roberts. Uh, Candidate Solomon, uh, would you like me to repeat the question? I think I got it. Thank okay. you. 
And candidate Roberts summed up the history of what got us to where we are quite well. I want to add on to that because I've been asked, what are you going to do when you get in office to actually bridge gaps and to work together? And this question is, is an example of something that we need to work together as Western Slope representatives to make sure that the rural area is represented when these uh, decisions come to pass. And I've already begun the steps to begin a Western Slope caucus with all of our senators and all of our representatives in the Western Slope allowing us to work together to be one stronger voice in the front range, which is the second plank in that urban rural bridge. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Solomon. And we'll stay with you for the next question. Many people believe political polarization is a problem in Colorado and across the US. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, how will you work to improve relationships across party lines? I guess I can tell the future. I just started answering that question. It is a problem. And this polarization, this divide, we need to look back at President Reagan when he said, we can agree on 80% of things, and we should focus on that and work as allies so that we can communicate for an expansion of knowledge and growth on the 20% that we disagree on. I've expanded on his quote. We need to stop communicating for conversion and we need to work for the betterment of our district and the betterment of our state as Coloradans. Put the people before the party. This divide has to go away. This caucus that I've started is the first step as representatives and as senators towards working as a unified voice. Us, everybody in this room, we need to come together, work jointly and collaboratively towards a better tomorrow and put this extremist division aside. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Roberts, uh, same question to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Well, I'm a proud member of the Western Slope Caucus at the legislature already, and I've worked uh, on bills with more Western Slope colleagues than anybody else. And there are far more Republicans in the Western Slope Caucus than the Democratic Caucus. I, every single bill I've passed except for one has had bipartisan support. And that's because when I take hear an idea from my constituent and turn it into a piece of legislation, I always go looking across the aisle to try to build partnerships because I believe it's good for my districts to be good for my colleagues on the Western Slope, regardless of party. And then we go and tell that story to our front range colleagues. If you're worried about bipartisanship or partisanship, look at my record. I walk the walk. I walk the walk in my legislation with my uh, work across the aisle. And I'm proud of the campaign that I'm running because I have not said a single negative word about my opponent directly from my campaign. I am walking the walk about bridging divides and not bringing partisanship into the state legislature where I think we need to be focused on results, not politics. Thank you. Candidate Roberts, we'll stay with you for our final question. If you are elected, what measurements for success should voters put on you in your first term? All right, great question. Uh, I value uh, constituent feedback and I am uh, transparent about uh, the work that we do. So I hope that in the metrics uh, that you would hold me accountable by are the things we're talking about this campaign, the things that we wanna do. We wanna make life more affordable here in our rural and mountain communities. We want to bring new jobs into these communities. We wanna protect our environment, stand up for our water. I hope at the end of the four years of this uh, Senate term, we can look back on some bills that I have been a part of that have done those things. I also uh, value transparency and openness, and I have uh, done this during my time as your state representative. I could plan to continue doing it. If you call my office, if you email me, if you show up to one of my town halls, you need help with a state agency, uh, you can get those uh, get that help from me and my office. I will continue to do that. This job is about being a representative of the district that we represent, not our personal agenda or, or high, making our careers a uh, higher profile. It's about serving you. And so I th hope that that's the metric you measure me by, that when you feel like you have an issue with the state government, you felt heard by me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, candidate Solomon, same question to you. Just to follow up, it, it, according to the representatives in the Western Slope, there is no Western Slope caucus. There were Western Slope town halls, and there's a dramatic difference in those two concepts. That said, when I vote, the Constitution comes first, the district comes second. So a measurement of success for me is that I have done that. And I've listened to every constituent in the district, not just the echo chamber, but the entire district. And in four years, when my term is up, I look forward to everybody in this room saying, 
Matt was transparent. Matt was honest. He served with integrity. He listened to us and party lines did not exist. That to me is a top measurement of sex success. The second layer of success is the decriminalization of all the laws that have happened in the last four years. We reversed that course. The fentanyl crisis is being addressed. Our mental health crisis is being addressed. You have more money in your pocket than you have today. And our teachers are, are paid and our education system is better than it was yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are ready for closing statements. Um, since candidate Robert started us off, candidate Solomon, would you like to offer yours? I appreciate all of you being here tonight. I appreciate Dylan being here tonight. And I hope that you are all actively engaged in listening and actually looking into the meat of what's at stake. We need balance at the state level to fully represent and get better policy out of the state. And I offer that balance. Our state as a whole could be balanced when I win. I propose that we take the foot off small business. Rather than regulate our businesses like what's happened in the last four years, let's foster their growth. Let's stop with all the illegal taxes and fees. Let's work on sustainable solutions that work in the long term. And let's let me represent our district, all of it. Again, thank you all for being here tonight. It's good to see you all. Thank you very much. And candidate Roberts, if you would like to offer your closing statements. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here tonight. It would be an honor to serve you as your next state senator. Uh, as I mentioned, we've accomplished uh, some good things for Route County over the last four years, but we have a lot more work to do. We need to make our communities more affordable. We need to protect our water and our environment from the threats that they face. And we need to make sure that these are communities where people can grow a business, raise a family, and retire. And I'm offering specific results and ideas for the future of Senate District 8. Uh, over all the bills that I've passed uh, during my time and uh, the work that I've done across the aisle, the, th I'm, the thing I'm most proud of is the amount of town halls I've held. Over 60 across House District 26, Eagle County and Route County, because I prioritize listening to all of you, our constituents. I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear about your challenges. And then I want to work with you down at the state capitol to turn those into results. I feel like I've done that for you um, so far. It would be an honor to continue working for you so that we can make Route County a better place to live for our future generations. And I look forward to working with everyone to make sure we do that, whether you vote for me or not. I'm Dylan Roberts. It'd be honored to be your next state senator. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, I got a little bit out of order. And so we are going to bring CJ Mucklow up to talk about the renewal of purchase of development rights. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Hey, I'm here um, on behalf of uh, Route County 1A, the continuation of the purchase of development rights program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kind of caught me off guard. I was expecting um i'm here just representing myself i want to make that really clear because i do volunteer for route county and i help make recommendations to the commissioners for the projects that the pdr programs approves so the pdr program is a continuation of a tax to put conservation easements on working landscapes in route county the program has been going on for about 18 years we're asking for an extension for another 10 years um it protects wildlife protects open land tracts of land for wildlife to use private and federally owned. It protects water, conservation site to tie water to the land, <clears throat> and it protects working landscapes. I think you all, those of you know me, <clears throat> I have a certain bias towards agriculture, and I'd like to see agriculture stay in Route County. So to date, the program has protected about 56,000 acres, and that's really important. We can do more in the future, and I'm looking forward to um, having this program continue to support the working landscapes and water and wildlife in Route County. Also is unique here in Route County, you know, we're a county that's actually 45% public or private land, much different than many other counties like Jackson Hole, it's 95% public land and protects its landscape. We need to protect our own landscape and that matters in a community like this one for a resort like this one. So thank you for your time and please consider voting yes on 1A. Well, I didn't know I had questions too. 
right. First one. How has the PDR program benefited local businesses and our economy? Well, that's a really good point, particularly related to non-ag businesses. We did a study at CSU several years ago that showed that summer tourists come here to um, the second reason, most popular reason they come in the summertime is for the landscape, and that's a private landscape. So that is worth more than the production of hay and cattle in this valley. So protecting lands in the interest of the resort economy for the landscape that it creates and, and the views that it has. So it's in everybody's interest to keep our landscape. Next question. Other PDR programs across the state have expanded their scope to use funds for other uses. The decision was made to stick with the same ballot language and program as passed before and not change it. Can you tell us a little bit about why that decision was made? That decision was made because we had to change, we had to, we liked what we did with the program to begin with. And if we were to change the scope of the program, we had to change the language of the ballot. And the language of the ballot has been successful. And we had to ask you if you wanted to increase your taxes we didn't want to really increase your taxes. We wanted to keep the same mill levy we had. So we didn't ask that question. We wanted to keep the program we have going and not expand it. How does the PDR program limit growth and will that affect or have any impact on the local housing crisis? Well, that's a great question. Where'd you get all these questions? I talked to him earlier. Um, that's a really good question where housing is an issue here, right? We have a real problem with affordable housing here. Well, PDR, you know, it's all PDR. If the strategy of Route County and Steamboat Springs is not to put affordable housing spread out across the county, so we're not in competition with affordable housing. And I don't think it's a good strategy to have affordable housing spread out given the service costs to have small acreages and housing spread all out. So this program protects wide open spaces outside of that area. And we're not in any, we're not trying to stop the needed um, housing of this community but those are better suited to be locally in, in an area next to already provided services like here in town. So we're not in competition, we're a different program. And rural subdivision is not a good way to have affordable housing. Thank you. One more question for you. The uh, newest ballot measure would sunset the PDR tax in 2035. Do you think that the PDR program will need to continue beyond that point? I can't predict that far into the future. So far, we've used up all the money we've had, and we've protected over 56,000 acres with this program. I think that we, at, at the rate we've seen in the past, that that's a prediction of the future is yes, we will use all those funds. If that day comes up in eight years and we no longer have a need for it, then somebody else will be up here saying we need to change it. But now we see a use for those funds to continue. I don't have any closing remarks. Got me off guard. I want to thank you all for having me here. Um, and I, I do believe in supporting uh, an economy that still has agriculture in it. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, CJ. It's at this point that I would like to um, invite my reporter. Um, Dylan Anderson is going to go ahead and moderate uh, one of the uh, discussions for us. Yes, I am. You're right. You're right. No, nope, no. Nope. All right. So for the next um, election forum, I would like to invite both of our candidates for House District 26 up. Uh, this is Megan Lukens and Savannah Wolfson. And before today's forum, uh, we flipped a coin and uh, candidate Lukens, you were the winner of that. So if you would like to offer your opening remarks first. Okay. Hi, can everyone hear me? I am Megan Lukens and I'm running for the Colorado House of Representatives, House District 26. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I am currently a social studies teacher at Steamboat Springs High School and I think we need more teachers in the state legislature. So I'm going for it. Uh, I am. I also grew up here and having grown up in Steamboat, I've seen uh, quite a few issues grow over time. And so I'm running on what I call the three E's, the economy and the environment and 
education. And so with the economy, uh, I look forward to addressing our affordable housing crisis, our early child care crisis, our workforce shortage, all these compounding issues impacting, uh, impacting our affordability issues. With the environment, I look forward to prioritizing Western Slope, uh, Western Slope water and multi-benefit water projects and water security, as well as addressing wildfire mitigation uh, and prioritizing wildfire, wildfire mitigation and prevention, as well as maintaining our beautiful public lands. And of course, uh, as a teacher, a current social studies teacher uh, with, a, with a master's degree in educational policy, I, I understand why we are 50th out of 50 states for lowest teacher pay. And I know that we must invest in our, in our future and invest in our education systems further. Furthermore, I'm proud to be the pro-choice candidate in this race, especially in a time when our state legislature is on the front lines protecting our basic rights. I tell my students every day that my number one favorite activity is learning because it's true. And I believe that we need more legislators that listen and learn. I value collaboration, communication, and partnership. Uh, and I look forward to bringing everyone to the table to really get results for our, our communities. I'm dedicated to this district. I'm dedicated to Colorado and I'm dedicated to finding uh, solutions. Education unites us. So let's send a teacher to the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Wolfson, if you would like to offer your opening remarks. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, I'm Savannah Wolfson, and thank you so much for the opportunity today. Thank you to the Steamboat Pilot for hosting, and thank you to the Colorado Association of Realtors for hosting, and thank you also to CAR for your endorsement. I'm a mom in South Route. You may know me as Savvy, the lady who sold you goat's milk soap, or who took the Colorado Master Gardeners course with you, went on homeschool field trips with you, and Route County Republican Secretary, or maybe I taught your child how to read at Sirocco Elementary. I never dreamed of running for office, but I decided to stand up for hardworking families like mine. Our kids deserve to inherit a state that is affordable and a safe place to live, and trained politicians are out of touch with our needs. I personally experience the cringe of the rising costs here. I pay for housing, and I deal with the childcare shortage. I fear what wolf reintroduction will do to my own livestock. And I have several close friends here who are survivors of domestic violence that was repeated. To address this, I have three priorities. The first is to stand up for rural people. And on day one, I will introduce legislation to stop wolf reintroduction onto the Western Slope. The second, thank you, is affordability. We need a candidate who believes in keeping your money in your pocket and protecting the taxpayers. I know that work, not taxation, creates wealth, so I want to get a lot of parents back to work. I experienced the child care shortage, and I am the best candidate in the race to address it. Finally, I want to stop the overuse of PR bonds. I personally have a friend who went through domestic violence here in Steamboat, and her abuser violated his restraining order 84 times. The shooting in Oak Creek last year was after a man was let out repeatedly on a PR bond. That's why these are my priorities because they are our community's priorities and I will stand up for you. Thank you. We'll start off the questions with candidate Wolfson. First one, with looming changes in the coal-fired power generation industry in the Yampa Valley, what is your plan to support the workers and their families during this transition and where will you get funding for it? Thank you for the question. Um, we have devastated our coal communities in this state, and that is because of a one party supermajority and one party rule. None of the Republicans were responsible for closing down the power plants, and I want to make that really clear. We are the party that stands up for energy, locally supplied energy. My husband is in the military and I'm a third generation military spouse, so I believe in energy independence. I do not believe in relying on hostile countries overseas to provide for what we can provide for ourselves. As far as helping communities, there is no plan and we can't fund it because we're losing all of our tax funding. I am the candidate though who will protect affordability in this area as the candidate who pays for housing, who pays for things here. I am the one who wants to keep your money in your pocket by protecting the taxpayers' bill of rights and protecting the taxpayers. Thank you. Candidate Lukens, would you like me to repeat the question? Good. Yes. 
I understand that this is a dire situation for uh, for House District 26. Um, our district's economy is reliant on our beautiful environment, and so it's imperative that we address uh, dire climate threats and address the economic situation that we are in, given the, the fact that the coal power plants are shutting down. Um, I support in all of the above domestic energy strategy, and I plan to uh, be supportive of this transition um, to renewable energy while supporting our communities transitioning away from coal, um, especially in Hayden and Craig. We must pre preserve our town culture, our towns and our culture, and incentivize new ways for workers, um, for workers to make a living. And I support diversifying the economy and leveraging our assets. And I look forward to working with local, state, and federal leaders. I look forward to working with Republicans and Democrats uh, to ensure a just transition and, uh, and to meet climate goals and ensure that our, our, we can continue economic vitality. Thank you. Thank you. All right, candidate Lukens, uh, we'll stay on you for the next question. Uh, both candidates in this race are on the record opposing the reintroduction of gray wolves in Colorado. If elected, what will you do from the state house to help ranchers in northwestern Colorado? Thank you. Great question. Uh, I do not support wolf reintroduction, and agriculture is so important in our in our communities in House District 26. My grandpa owns a cattle ranch, and this is very important in my family. I've talked with ranchers across the district. I've toured so many of our beautiful ranches across the district. I've actually met with the Gittlesons in Jackson County that is really ground zero uh, for, for being impacted by wolves, and I know that this is also uh, happening in, in Meeker as well. Um, so it is um, as a legislator, my job would be to distribute compensation for losses and funding for mitigation to ensure wolves um, don't cause damage to livestock and communities. We can uh, find proactive solutions, and it's imperative that we that we uh, help people move forward. I look forward to working with with Democrats and Republicans on this issue to prioritize our agricultural communities, especially with compensation and mitigation. And I look forward to working with our agricultural leaders on this issue. Thank you. Candidate Wolfson, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I'm good. Thank okay. you. Um, I believe only one candidate is actually on the record opposing it before deciding to run for the seat. And I think that is important to mention that that candidate is me. As the candidate who was living on the Western Slope the year that wolves were voted on, I was speaking out against this actively. I personally have goats, like I said, and I am worried about wolf reintroduction and South Route. Mitigation, I mean, um, sorry, there's no compensation for when you have bred several generations of cattle and they a wolf goes after the mama cow she is not for meat they're paid for by the hanging price for meat and that's not compensation that's fair for what she is it also does not make up for the emotional devastation that this will have on our ranching lifestyle I, as I said before, am the candidate who will introduce legislation on day one to stop wolf reintroduction. Boulder brought it to us, not the Western Slope. We all voted no, and it's not fair that we should have to face this. Thank you, candidate Wolfson. And candidate Wolfson, uh, we'll start with you on this question. Uh, Colorado's current assessment percentage for residential property tax is 7.15% for all, uh, I'm, let me start this again. Colorado's current assessment percentage for residential property tax is 7.15%. And for all commercial and business personal property, the assessment is 29%. Do you support these percentages? And if not, what should they be? Hmm. Great question. At some point, you're going to run out of other people's money to spend. And in the past few years, our state budget has grown by $10 billion with no rise in wages. It's become completely unaffordable for young families like mine. It's become completely unaffordable for a lot of seniors that I talk to who are on fixed incomes. They cannot afford any more tax increases. We need to elect candidates who have the same funding priorities as everyday average people. As a mom, I will prioritize funding our schools, which I do believe are underfunded, I will prioritize increasing access to childcare, but I will not be looking to increase our taxes in any way in the following year because families are really struggling. The workforce is really struggling. Senior citizens are really struggling. 
We do need lower taxes in the state, and I will reach across the aisle and try to find fiscally responsible Democrats to make sure that we can have lower taxes. Thank you. Candidate Lukens, uh, same question to you. Uh, thank you. Given that the Gallagher Amendment was repealed and that we are working in two years towards a new formula for our communities in this regard, and given that this is a, a huge category of what I studied when I got my master's degree in educational policy, as this is all impacting our education systems as well as impacting our affordability issues within House District 26, uh, and given that I am a government teacher and I know how government works, uh, I look forward to working as, as a team player, working across the aisle with uh, working with Republicans and Democrats. Democrats, as well as working with our community leaders uh, to to figure out um, how we can how we can come up with with good numbers that everyone um, that everyone you know bring everyone to the table to get to a point where we have a solid understanding and a solid um, new formula when that comes up in the future. So I look forward to working with with uh, the many partnerships that I've created throughout House District 26 on this. Thank you. Um, staying with you, candidate Lukens, what is one piece of legislation that you support? that also might have a chance of being passed by the Colorado legislature next year? Oh, well, great question. Uh, so in general, there, there are so many um, there are so many opportunities to really help uh, address the issues, especially the issues that I mentioned um, with, with, at the beginning with my three E's, the economy, the environment, and education. And I've had a lot of, of leaders across the state and within our communities come to me uh, with potential um, bills that we could we could look at to be supportive of. Um, and, and the reality is that we can't do it alone. We have to do it through collaboration and, and partnership. And uh, and so there's a lot of bills in, in general that, that have come to me looking at, at education-related issues and affordable housing housing and wildfire mitigation and uh, transportation and, and mental health and really being supportive of our communities that are facing these issues. Uh, and so I look forward to, to being a team player. I look forward to working with community leaders to get results on these issues uh, with using as many partners as possible to really advocate, advocate for House District 26 in the Western Slope. Thank you. And candidate Wolfson, same question. Thank you. Well, I've already spoken about my first piece of legislation. My second piece of legislation will be to address the child care crisis. And I am the candidate who has visited multiple child care centers to see the regulations that they have to follow and observe closely what regulations are hurting their businesses. They are small businesses and they provide service to small businesses and parents so that our district can get back to work. So I will bring together child care experts and I will find a mom across the aisle who is also facing the same problem. And we will work together to reduce regulations on licensed in-home child care centers while still keeping children safe. And then the third piece of legislation I will introduce is to stop the overuse of PR bonds. Like I said, my close friend went through domestic violence here in Steamboat Springs and her abuser violated his restraining order 84 times. I believe that Democrats wanna protect women too. So I will find a Democrat who wants to work with me on this issue. No PR bonds for violent offenders and no automatic PR bonds. Thank you. Moving into closing remarks, candidate Wolfson, if you would like to go first. Thank you. The question to ask as you're voting this year is, are you better off today financially than you were two years ago? So far, our leadership shows no sign of understanding the connections between bad policies and the rising cost of living. We need more than buzzwords. We need problem solvers, specific plans and solutions. We need balance. We need candidates who have a history of disagreeing with their party. And we need to have conversations at the legislature before bills pass into the law. We are 17 votes down for Republicans in the Colorado State House right now. So there is not a lot of reaching across the aisle. There is not a lot of collaboration. We need to have more balance in Colorado because we are not a red or a blue state. We believe in putting people over party. I am fighting for my kids and I will be putting Colorado's kids before my own party. And I will be fighting for our community before my own party. I'm Savannah Wolfson and I'm running for House District 26. Thank you. Candidate Lukens, if you would like to offer your closing remarks. 
I have always told my students that my favorite activities are listening and learning, and we need more legislators that listen and learn. I will represent every, uh, every corner of House District 26 by listening to and learning from stakeholders, experts, and our communities on each and every issue. As someone who grew up in, lives in, and works in House District 26, I have deep-rooted connections within the community. Having grown up here, I have roots in all corners of House District 26. On the campaign trail, I have strengthened my partnerships and relationships with many prominent organizations that make a difference in the lives of the hardworking families of House District 26. My campaign priorities come back to the three E's, the economy, the environment, and education. I will work with stakeholders, experts, and our community to get results. House District 26 needs a leader who can rise above polarization and negativity. That leader is me. I'm running to help the people of House District 26 and get results for our communities. I'm Megan Lukens. Education unites us. So let's send a teacher to the Colorado State Legislature. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, it's at this point that I'm going to take a little bit of break and uh, lean on my reporter to uh, take the uh, next forum. Okie do. Let's, let's first of all give Eli a little bit of a round of applause. He's doing a great job. He, he said he hasn't moderated a debate in seven years. So, I mean, it looks like he just did it last night. Um, so next, we're going to have our forum with our two county commissioner candidates. So if you guys would come up, I'm going to drop the little bit of the formal candidate so-and-so, and we're just going to go Kathy and Sonia, if that's all right with everybody. Okay, Bill. By the way, I'm Dylan. I write on the county. That would mean that I kind of write about everything now, but um, I started here as a county reporter and I'm at the county commissioner meetings every week, probably been there more than anybody who doesn't get paid by the county. So, um, good to go. Okie doke. So for our, so we did the, the coin flip earlier. It was, it was epic. Um, <laughs> and Kathy is going to start with her opening statement. Thank you. My name is Kathy Meyer, and I'm going to ask you a question. What job skills are necessary to be a highly effective county commissioner? The job should be administrative, like a board of directors of a corporation, not political. A good commissioner represents all of Route County, not just one political party issue or geographic section. She will be well-versed in land use issues and a strong student of financial management. I have these qualities. I've spent the last 27 years serving Route County and 21 years in local government, including 15 years on the Steamboat Springs Planning Commission, six years on the City Council, and 17 years on the Yampa Valley Housing Authority. Before that, I spent 25 years in the financial management field, ultimately as a senior vice president overseeing billion of dollars and a large staff of over 125 persons. I learned fiscal discipline and an understanding of complex financial structures. My experience with both corporate and government has taught me to maintain a common sense approach, be a good listener and seek reasonable solutions to complex problems. In my first year on the commission, I would strengthen the collaboration with the municipalities of Hayden, Oak Creek and Yampa. During my tenure on city council, I played the lead role in planning, building, and the fiscal oversight of the combined law enforcement, jointly owned by the city and county, which saved the taxpayers $3 million in avoiding duplication in the cost of services and facilities. We need to work together to build a community on projects of mutual benefit, while at the same time being fiscally frugal with taxpayer dollars. I'm motivated to continue my public service and would be honored to represent all of your commissioners as Rod County. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. My name is Sonia Macy's and I'm running to be your next Route County Commissioner. I believe that my vision, experience and relationships have, will help me hit the ground running as your County Commissioner. 
One of the things about my vision is I think it's also your vision. I think that we all want the quality of life in Route County to be as good or better tomorrow as it is today. So how do we get there? We get there by balancing growth as we have in the past with things like preservation of natural resources, cultural resources, water resources, and working agriculture, which is hugely important to us. We get there by recognizing that the local workforce is the backbone of our community and we have to support that workforce. With affordable housing, equitable access to childcare, to broadband, which we've seen is hugely important, health services, and also transportation. I feel as though I'm prepared to, to be your county commissioner because I've, I've, I've done these things before. I've served two terms on the Steamboat Springs City Council. The first was through the Great Recession. I hope everybody remembers how difficult a time that was and having strong fiscal discipline and making appropriate investments got us through and we're here today. In my second term, we worked on climate action and I'm very proud of the climate action plan that we've passed and I look forward to continuing to work on that. I've also served on the Yampa Valley Electric Association board. So these questions about coal and transition and the new energy economy are right here for me, just having left that board in June. I'm very proud also of having served as the executive director of Yampa Tika, where we provided equitable access to environmental education to every single child at the K to five level in Route County. And through that experience, I've gotten to know how unique and special each part of Route County is. I want to be the county commissioner who represents everybody in this county, and I'd be proud to serve you and hope to get your vote. Thank you. Thank you both. So our first question will go to Sonia. You both have said you agree on the newly updated county master plan, of which a big part of that is centering growth in urban centers. How do you plan to manage growth totally beyond that, more specifically? manage growth beyond? Well, I think the master plan articulates very clearly that the growth needs to go where the infrastructure is. So we're talking about obviously the first priority being the already developed areas, but the second tier is the communities who want to grow. So for example, if we look at places like Clark, uh, there might be an interest actually in having a little bit more infrastructure to be able to grow. If we look at places like Yampa, they've specifically said, we really don't want more growth. As a county commissioner, I'll be the liaison to the state government and I have great relationships with the federal government. There, there will be funding available to advance priorities like developing infrastructure for where growth is needed. And I think I will be the better candidate to access those resources given that I have done quite a bit of fundraising for community-based priorities in the past. Do you need me to repeat the question? No, I'm fine. Um, I think the, the newly adopted master plan uh, ensures that we have uh, uh, opted for the vision that we had 20 years ago. That's a good vision and it's it's confirmed in the new master plan. The two areas of growth that have been identified are Stagecoach and West of Steamboat. And I think there are things that the county commissioner can do, including improving the roads to Stagecoach, making them safer, and again, supporting the West of Steamboat Brown Ranch which they've done by um, allocating a million dollars of county funds to help uh, leverage grants. So I'm totally in favor of the current master plan. Okie doke. Second question. We'll start with Kathy this time. Route County, Moffat County, Steamboat and Craig have partnered on a study to explore the feasibility of a regional transportation authority. Both of you said have said that you would support some sort of RTA. What does an RTA look like to you? Well, first of all, um, the Regional Transportation Authority, or the RTA, um, we have a study underway. And until that study comes in, it's very difficult to say what it should be or should not be. But the bottom line is ultimately, whatever plan we come up with as a community, it will be referred to the voters. And at the end of the day, it's the voters who get to decide whether the plan is worthy of their tax issue tax dollars. And again, I believe that um, it's an important concept that things that we're talking about are voter approved. It's not just the county commissioners making decisions. Sonia. 
I love this question. I've actually implemented a regional transportation authority in my past, so I've seen how successful it can be. And as Kathy said, the voters do decide on it. Ultimately, it's our job to assemble a plan that includes things that are of priority to the voters. So some of the things that I've been very publicly supportive of are repurposing the railway to get that rail into commuter line and give commuters their lives back. They don't need to spend countless hours on the roadways. I'd also like to see us have a core trail from Stagecoach State Park to Dinosaur National Monument, not just for recreation, but for commuting because we need it. There's also discussion of a gondola from mountain to town. And I wanna be clear about this. If that were to be done, it wouldn't be the taxpayers paying for it. It would be the ski corps paying for it because they've already indicated that they would be willing to consider a lift ticket tax if we were to think big and consider a gondola from mountain to town. So that would not be a priority that would be paid for by the voters. But these are some of the ideas I'm bringing to the table. I do think big, as Kathy mentioned, there is a study underway and we'll see if the study meets my vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. For our third question, we'll start with Sonia. If elected, how will you support the Hayden Station families or employees and their families as they transition away from coal-fired power generation while also trying to limit impacts on local tax taxing districts and the county itself? That is a great question. And as a Yampa Valley Electric Association board member, I saw the just transition up front and, and personal. I'd like to just make clear that it wasn't a Republican or a Democrat that closed those plants. It was the company that closed the plants. And in speaking with the commissioners, the increased values, real estate values have offset the revenues that we're losing from those plants. That does not replace the jobs that we're losing though. And that's an incredibly important piece of this. So I would support Dylan Roberts in helping to transition the plant into renewable energy as has been discussed and as bio, whether it's biomass or this uh, molten salt, which is an incredible concept. I would also support the Hayden Business Park and trying to encourage that community to thrive. They have already demonstrated an investment in creating jobs and we need to support that all day long and twice on Sunday. Well, I think Hayden has been very visionary in recognizing that it needs to change uh, based on what, what potentially is going to happen in the future. And um, I, what I mean by that is they have gotten support from the county and I would support it as a commissioner to do a traditional land use improvement such as the industrial park. When you look at airports around the country, it's very common to have industrial parks. I think that the county can do more uh, in terms of helping fund writing letters of recommendation. I think the the industrial park has an opportunity to bring jobs and new companies to Hayden. And again, we, we need to support those communities that are being impacted by uh, the uh, uh, energy change that we're facing. Thank you very much. Okay, last question, we'll start with Kathy. Rau County and local and other local municipalities, including Steamboat, have partnered on the Rau County Act Climate Action Plan. Do you support the Climate Action Plan, and what do you see as opportunities and challenges when implementing it? I did support. I voted for the Climate Action Plan when it was presented to the City Council, and and, and so did my opponent. Um, one of the things I asked for was a timeline in terms of implementation and a cost. I want to know what it's going to cost and how we're going to phase in all of these ideas in a time when we're looking to uh, we're facing uh, what I think is a recession and we are faced with a, a very a county that is a high cost of living. I want to see what the cost of the plan is. And so I am for it uh, in concept but I need to see what it's going to cost and how and when we're going to implement it. Thank you. Sonia. Well, I'm an outspoken advocate for climate action and that is no secret, I don't think to anybody. Um, I only not only supported the plan, but encourage people to consider this for the past decade very strongly. I. Um, see very many opportunities in the plan. One of them is that we are very well aligned with our peers in mountain communities, the state and the federal government. 
So there's opportunity for funding to bring to Route County, and I think I can go get that. There's also an opportunity within the plan called a Renewable Energy Mitigation Program, which is a funding mechanism. So I will encourage the Climate Action Collaborative to consider this as a good way to get some funding in the bank to start taking action. And we're already taking action, regardless of whether or not we have funding, there are actions that have been taken already, actually including uh, work that has been done with the plastic bag fee. Um, so there are things that we are already have underway. We had a funding source that was passed by city council. And as far as challenges, um, I think we've already done the hard work, which is bringing every single municipality together around the notion that climate action is real. We need to address it immediately. Thank you both very much. So now we'll give you an opportunity to do a closing statement. And Sonia, you can go first. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm, I said in my opening statement that I think I have the relationships to, to get things done for you. And that's what this is about to me is getting things done for you. I'm not in this to rack up a title or to take a stepping stone into the future. This is about the constituents. And as I've been out knocking on doors, what I've been hearing from people is they appreciate my honesty, my integrity, and my clarity of purpose. So I can commit to you right now that you will always know where I stand and you will always know how I got there. I think that is one of the reasons that I've been endorsed by many of our local leaders and our entire congressional delegation. And I think that's important because we're at a point where we can bring a lot of opportunity to Route County. All eyes are on us. And I think we need somebody in the driver's seat as a commissioner who will make sure that we get our piece of the pie when it comes to some of these incredible funding opportunities for things like climate action, regional transportation, affordable housing, and childcare. Thank you very much. And Kathy, Thank you. I'd like to leave you with one question. We have a housing crisis and which candidate has demonstrated the ability to get things done? I helped negotiate the acquisition of the 55 units of the Hillside Village Apartments. I negotiated the city loan for the acquisition of the 68 lots at Fish Creek Mobile Home Park. I was the Yampa Valley Housing Authority board rep on the building and sale of 30 condominium units at Fish Creek. I've pounded nails, I've hung drywall, as president of the Habitat for Humanity. I've helped improve the lives of the citizens of, Steam, of Rob County for 21 years. And I'd like your vote to continue my public service. Because as my slogan says, being a county commissioner is not a job, it's a privilege. And there's only one endorsement that I want, and that's your vote. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Dylan. And we're going to have Eli come back after a brief break to close this out. Okay, I believe we have one election forum left on the agenda for today. And this will be uh, two individuals, both named Robin. Uh, there will be Robin Shepard uh, speaking for and Robert Cregan speaking against the Steamboat Springs uh, two-way ballot measure, also known as the short-term rental tax. All right, we'll start with uh, opening remarks. And the opening is uh, Robin Shepard. Great, thanks. So hello, my name is Robin Shepard and I'm one of the volunteers in an organization called House Our Community. And thank you for hosting this forum. I've lived in Steamboat Springs for over 10 years and I've witnessed firsthand the affordable housing crisis worsen over the last decade. That's why I support the proposed tax on short-term rentals. We have a severe affordable housing crisis in Steamboat Springs and need to take action now. The demand for workforce housing has outpaced supply. We know we need 1,400 homes for individuals and families that don't have safe and affordable housing now. Families are living in bedrooms, not houses. Renters are living in constant fear their landlords will cancel their leases. And families are leaving because they just can't make it work anymore. 
This affordable housing crisis is also affecting our businesses. We can't have a strong and healthy workforce without housing for our workers. Businesses can't hire their workers they need to maintain and thrive. Restaurants are leaving sections open because they don't have enough servers. The Steamboat School District has over 40 positions open because teachers can't find a place to live. Even nurses and doctors can't find places to live. The 2A ballot measure strikes the right balance between maintaining the current strength of our economy and providing funding for affordable housing throughout Steamboat Springs. It also closes a tax loophole. Short-term rentals are businesses, yet they are not taxed like businesses. Hotels like the Rabbit Ears Motel and the Nordic Inn pay their fair share, yet short-term rentals pay the same taxes that you do for your house. That's not fair. By taxing visitors, who use short-term rentals at 9% tax, the City of Steamboat Springs will raise over $14 million annually that will be used to invest in affordable and attainable housing. So please join us in voting yes on 2A. When we have affordable housing for workers, we will have a thriving community. Thank you. Robin Cragen, if you'd like to offer your opening remarks. Thank you. Um, my name is Robin Cragen. Uh, I've made my home in Steamboat Springs for the past 25 years. And during that time, we've raised a family and we've grown a small business um, from almost nothing to, to, to be something that I'm very proud to be part of. I'm not ashamed that a core piece of our business is short-term rentals. We've given back to the community and we've supported the community, which has also supported us over this time. But I'm worried about the direction where our community is heading with 2A. And I'm asking you to stop and think and then say, no way on 2A. It's supposed to help, but it's actually going to cause more harm than good. Jason Peasley said in his recently revealed Brown Ranch plan that nobody would be left behind, but 2A have approved will leave behind many of the several thousand hardworking locals who have dedicated themselves to supporting a level of world-class hospitality that is the, at the heart of our steamboat economy. Not just talking about those employed in lodging, housekeeping, maintenance, but also the hundreds of associated businesses that include electricians, HVAC, hot tubs, vehicle maintenance, roofing, window cleaning, just to name a few. As we ride this current recessionary downturn, the almost 80% increase in taxes on all non-hotel lodging, 2A will significantly reduce occupancy, which trickles down and hurts restaurants and the hundreds of local businesses. Supporters of 2A say that one in three homes have been lost to STRs, but this is not accurate. It's an extreme tax policy that is sent around, centered around it and hits our traditional lodging base that is at the heart of the economy. These properties make up more than 95% of STRs, not the Airbnb in our neighborhood. What we have in 2A is financial support for a massive billion dollar development at the Brown Ranch that is a rushed and unapproved plan. It's simply not ready. There's no annexation agreement, no agreement with the city of Steamboat Springs for essential services, fire police, street maintenance, and bus service. Thank, Thank you. you. Starting off. Okay. First question will go to you, Mr. Craigan. What do you expect to happen if voters approve the proposed 9% tax on short-term rentals, and what data can you produce to support your argument? Um, what I can share with you is that the guests who stay in short-term rentals spend approximately $250 million per year. That goes to the businesses in our economy that represents over 50% of our economy. We anticipate that an increase of this magnitude, over an 80% increase in tax, could reduce demand for steamboat lodging by between 10 and 20%. Just a 10% decrease in occupancy extracts $25 million from our community, all just to raise a tax for $14 million. In my opinion, the data points to the fact that we would go backwards instead of forwards. Jobs are gonna be impacted. It's gonna take years for us to recover. It's gonna take years to deliver the housing that is actually what we need. So what we need is housing built around infrastructure that already exists, something that's more shovel ready more doable than the dream, the pipe dream of the Brown Ranch. Thank you. Robin Shepard, uh, same question to you. Yeah, great. Uh, 
Well, I think if we pass this tax, um, we will see a thriving community and thriving businesses because right now we need, we know we need a, a strong and healthy workforce. So as I said before, what I with affordable housing, what I would see, I would love to see that all the positions are filled at the local high school, the elementary schools and the middle school, that restaurants are thriving, that the hotels are thriving, that our hospital has all the, the um, positions uh, in. So I think we're going to have a more divorce, diverse economy, and we'll also have affordable housing throughout our area. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll stay with you, Ms. Shepard. Uh, how have short-term rentals affected the traditional lodging industry, such as hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, and steamboat, and how would a new tax on short-term rentals impact these local businesses? Well, I think the first thing that we say, as I mentioned before, is that short-term rentals right now pay uh, the property taxes like a residential home, which is uh, what was mentioned before, 7%. Uh, hotels and motels pay 29%. So it would close a tax loophole, and short-term rentals then would contribute to our economy to raising $14 million annually. And that would be used for all affordable housing. So it could be used at the Brown Ranch, which is one of the solutions for our affordable housing crisis. But at the same time, it could be used for any affordable housing. So if the school district, for example, wants to partner with the Yampa Valley Housing and use their land to do affordable housing, they could use that funding. So that $14 million a year can, can put a dent and solve our affordable housing crisis. Uh, Mr. Cragen, same question. question again. Yes. How have short-term rentals affected the traditional lodging industry, such as hotels, motels, bed and breakfast is bre bed and breakfast in steamboat? And how would a new tax on short-term rentals impact these local businesses? Okay. I wanted you to restate the question because of the fact that uh, what you may not realize is that the traditional lodging base of Steamboat Springs, since I moved to this town, and, you know, I would say going back over 30 years is that short-term rentals have been a significant piece of this. It's a mistake to believe that short-term rentals are not the condos and um, properties up at the base of the mountain, which is where 95% of what is now called the short-term rental is located. So these are an essential component of our economy. And if we tax them in this way, we are taking ourselves backwards. It is actually going to impact you know, I, I disagree with the idea that restaurants will thrive because less restaurants experienced a significant downturn in business this summer and lodging experienced a 30% decline in business this summer. So as we head into a recession, the idea that a 400% increase in the lodging tax and 80% increase in the total tax on lodging could in any way do anything other than reduce occupancy. We'll stay with Mr. Cragen for the next question. Many mountain resort communities are weighing new taxes and restrictions on short-term rentals, but there are many forces pushing on the local housing market. To what degree do you believe that short-term rentals impact the, available how, the availability of housing for local workers? Uh, this is something that is, uh, is one of the toughest things to hear because I would tell you, um, I run a business where I could tell you that not one single home that we manage because the homes that we manage are at the base of the ski area around the mountain area. Not one single of those homes is in any way affordable for our workforce. And that is the truth for the majority of the homes that are rented out. And it is the, the truth for um, the, the majority of the properties that are classified as um, short-term rentals. So um, can you restate the question again? Uh, to what degree do you believe that short-term rentals impact the availability so, of housing? So the missing piece here is the data. There is no data to support this argument. We call it a lazy correlation at best. It makes sense, so people follow the argument. But the city council has refused to study it. And the only studies that I have seen indicate that the only crossover is at a very low level, perhaps as low as 3% of our housing. So it's not the main contributor to the housing shortage. It never has been. Thank you. Uh, Robin Shepard, uh, same question. 
Um, it's a really good question. And um, I agree with Robin that there's not a lot of studies. What some of the information that we have is that uh, one in three homes are short-term rentals. Um, and the biggest issue that we have is that the commercial market has not built affordable housing. That's the bigger issue, is that we need to have organizations like government organizations like the Yampa Valley Housing Authority that has access to government funds to build affordable housing. So for the last 10 years, we haven't built affordable housing. And so I believe that it, it's more important for us to create a financial revenue stream of $14 million a year so we can create housing at diverse levels so that our residents have choices in homes in this community. Thank you. Last question, uh, and we'll stay with Robin Shepherd for this one. How would you convince someone who's struggling to find housing or someone who owns a short-term rental to vote for or against this measure? Well, um, I'd like to convince everybody in this room to vote for this and everybody in Steamboat Springs, I can vote for this, is that um, we need affordable housing. So if you rely on a teacher, if you rely, if you go to a restaurant, if you go, if you have somebody who cleans your house, if you want to have a bus driver, um, if anybody that is working with you and um, for your family or your business, the only way that we're going to keep our workforce is to have affordable housing. So I would hope that you will vote yes on 2A so that we could have diverse housing for our workforce. Thank you. Mr. Cragen, would you like me to repeat the question? Sure. How would you convince someone? who's struggling to find housing or someone who owns a short-term rental to vote for or against the measure? Um, well, obviously I'm sitting here urging the community to stop and think about what the impacts of 2A would be. So I'm encouraging you to say no way on 2A because I don't think it's gonna provide the solutions that you're looking for. Housing is not an instant solution. The vision that was presented for the Brown Ranch is incomplete. And quite honestly, I believe it's not fundable, not even if you do pass 2A. The director of the housing authority said, if you don't pass 2A, it's okay, we'll figure it out. So I think that there are other solutions and these other solutions were presented by the lodging community that came together with the entire business community and offered over $40 million as a commitment towards short-term housing, uh, sorry, uh, to affordable housing um, in shovel-ready projects, leveraging existing infrastructure. Those are projects that can come out of the ground quicker and more efficiently and effectively than um, something that's going to take five years before it even gets started. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're ready for closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Cregan, if you'd like to go first. Thank you. Uh, thanks all for coming and listening. Some of you may be worried that opposing 2A means that you're voting against solutions for housing. But as I just said, Jason Peasley said, if, it's, if we don't pass 2A, it's fine. We'll figure it out. So I encourage you to say no A on 2A because I think there's an opportunity to, re return, to return to the $40 million offered by the lodging community, which would 40X, 40 times multiply the Yampa Valley Housing Authority budget. If the Yampa Valley Housing Authority can double the money through grants, this would, could be as much as $80 million for shovel-ready affordable housing projects that leverage the existing infrastructure. It allows us to find ways to house our community together and still keep Steamboat Steamboat. Brown Ranch is not what we need. More traffic, 10,000 more people, thousands more cars, and even more jobs needing more housing. Annexation has failed twice for these same reasons. So say no way on 2A because the cart is before the horse. The Brown Ranch is too big with too many unknowns that Thank point you. towards development that will run into the billions. Thank you. And closing remarks, Ms. Shepard. Thanks. Uh, in closing, I would like to lay out what we think is fair for our community. To us, fair means a strong, healthy, diverse workforce made up of families, young people, old people, and everything in between having the ability to find a home they can afford. Fair means every business in our community is held to the same standard when it comes to commercial property taxes.
FAIR means that businesses, nonprofits, schools, and our hospital can find the workers they need to thrive. FAIR means significant, critical, and urgent investments of $14 million annually that would help Steamboat build affordable housing and choices for our residents. So what's not FAIR? Entire families living in bedrooms, workers sleeping in their cars, and longtime residents leaving because they can't make ends meet. It's not fair that short-term rentals have a tax advantage and pay just a quarter the commercial property tax rate. So we need that money to build affordable housing, including the Brown Ranch. So if you believe in our vision of fairness and want to finally solve the affordable housing crisis, we urge you to vote yes on 2A. Thanks. Thank you. Now, before we conclude today, um, I'd like to ask for a round of applause for our timekeepers. They've done an amazing job. And then also one last round of applause for the Steamboat Board of Real Realtors. Realtors. Need to say that right. And also the Steamboat Chamber as well, too. And thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>